three o'clock, so let's make a start. I think Kathy's um, talk served as a fantastic introduction to mine, because what I did was to analyse some of the my lectures and um, to see how I position students um, interested in, in being able to shift power um, boundary in that class. So I'll explain a bit more about that. So I teach on the Faculty of Science Extended Degree Program, and that's different from other faculties because we only start in the second quarter. Um, and so what happens is all students start together in the mainstream courses, um, and then after the first test, which they write after four weeks across all their subjects, they decide if they want to transfer one or two or four of their courses to the extended degree program, and then they start afresh in the extended course. So they've had a, a taste of the mainstream. There isn't this resentment of, I'm sure I could cope on, on the mainstream, and they, they're, given, they're given options as to, as to how they manage that whole, that whole process of stuff. Um, this year, that's how many students? I've got 68. Um, and I see them every day in the morning and one afternoon a week. One week we have a lab prac and then the following week we have a whiteboard tutorial. Some of you may have heard me speak about whiteboard tutorials earlier. Um, and I've more and more come to understand that the way I look at this course is through the lenses of power and identity. Okay. Um, that that's really helpful as kind of my, my lens on it. And what I want to talk about now is power, not identity, although obviously issues of identity come into it as well. Okay, so in regard to physics, it's recognized as powerful knowledge. Okay, that's not just because I'm a physicist that I say that. Um, these, <laughs> there are other people who say that. And that's because it's specialized knowledge, different from everyday knowledge. Um, it's systematic, and it's generalizable beyond specific cases. Okay, Newton's laws apply uh, wherever, whenever. Okay. Um, not the same as knowledge of the powerful, which is generally the knowledge of the humanities and sort of cultural knowledge um, that people possess. Um, nonetheless, there are tensions that inhibit efforts to provide that powerful knowledge to socioeconomically disadvantaged students, and that's not just in the South African context. Okay. Um, and then we have the traditional classroom situation where traditionally the teacher is cast as powerful and the students as powerless. Um, and in UCT we make it even worse. Firstly, they come into the extended degree program having come out of their, the schools they came from where they were positioned as top students and they're now positioned as bottom students, first year students. But more than that, we give them disadvantage factors. We don't give them potential factors. We give them disadvantage factors, okay? Um, and so there's this power differential between the discipline of physics and the, and the EDP physics student. Yet we expect them to, pro, uh, to produce texts that require voice, in particular lab reports, where they have to report on what I did, um, and also solve problems from this powerless position. Um, so one of my goals is to shift the balance of power. Okay? Um, and so when the opportunity came around to produce a chapter for a book that's been um, produced on extended curriculum programs in the Western Cape. I put my hand up, okay, uh, because I thought it would be helpful to reflect more on my practice. Okay. And so in order to do this, what I did was I took my lecture videos as my dark data, okay, took them off Wula, and I analyzed them in terms of power. But the uh, framework that I used for this is Clarissa Hayward's notion of power which is not that power uh, is just the powerful and the powerless. She rejects that binary and says, actually, power is a network of boundaries that delivered for all what is socially possible. Okay? So there are limitations on what the student can do, but there are also limitations on what the lecturer can do. Okay? And I, I experience that with very in re real terms, that if I deviate too far from what st my students think is acceptable, socially acceptable of a physics lecturer, uh, then there's resistance that I'm up against. Okay. Um, and so to shift power, we need to negotiate, renegotiate those boundaries. Um, and, and that's what a power shift is about. Okay. So what I did was I asked myself, how do I position my students um, and myself and the discipline of physics and, in fact, the university, and do the ways in which I position those have any potential to shift boundaries? Okay. So I needed a means to reflect critically on my practice, 
took the first seven lecture videos. Seven's the magic number because by then we'd done everything in the course. We'd had lectures, a Friday tutorial, a Tuesday afternoon tutorial, and a Tuesday afternoon practical. Okay. Um, and it was six weeks later that I then went back and watched the videos, and I tried to identify all those moments where I was either positioning students, myself, physics, or UCT, in what I said mostly and sometimes in what I did. Okay, so that gave me a fair amount of data to work with. Um, Recognising that a single move can position one more, more than one actor. Okay, so something that I can that I do can position both myself and, and the students. Okay, and then I subjected that to an analysis of categories, um, and which I will show you. Obviously, the limitations is my perspective, and there's also positioning that happens through absences, through silences. I haven't looked at that. I've only looked at what I said and did. Okay. So, what do I come up with? Well. Every single lecture, to my surprise, I position the students as capable in some way or another and as having re relevant existing knowledge. Um, every new thing I started off with, um, I asked the students to do something, expecting them to be able to do it, expecting them to have some relevant prior knowledge. Um, and it was interesting to me, although that I know that my aim is to, to position them in in a different way from this deficit discourse, I was surprised to see it in every single lecture in some form or another. Okay. Um, I also p positioned them as diverse in terms of language. Uh, one of the things I gave them to do was to translate an explanation that I'd written into a different language, and then I got different people in the class to read different languages. Uh, we had Kulza and um, Afrikaans and even uh, Shivenda. Um, and then in a, the, that would have been the, the, it was a tutorial following that. Um, I said you can use whatever language you want to, language is a resource for thinking. Um, and then I also positioned them as diverse in terms of their learning. So I, there's a method that I use, footprints across sand, everybody takes their own journey through this lecture. Um, I also positioned them as having feelings, um, and that those feelings are important. Uh, the background to this is that 36% per of BSc students uh, returning at the beginning of this year who responded to a, a questionnaire during registration said that one of the reasons they didn't do as well as they might have last year was because of mental health problems. Okay, and those are the ones who self-identified mental health problems, 36% okay, of 380 students that responded. needing to sleep more, because I've discovered that mostly they're working on four to five hours of sleep, um, needing to change study habits, that it's not good enough to just read physics, you actually have to work through the problems, um, and needing to take responsibility for their own learning. Only once did I position them as scientists. Um, I gave them a graph and said, you're good scientists, what do you notice? Okay. So that's my positioning, the categories of positioning that I observed of myself for positioning students. What about myself? So again, I was surprised to see that in every single lecture, I um, uh, positioned myself as fallible in some way. In the opening lecture, I said to them, if things aren't working as they should be, please tell us. We make mistakes. Okay? Um, and generally, when I put up answers to something, uh, an exercise that I'd given them to do, I would say, have I managed to get it right? You can't trust me, I must make mistakes, which of course is completely true. I'm always a little tentative when I put up an answer because I do make mistakes. Um, also, <laughs> position myself as very needy, wanting feedback the whole time. Um, either using multiple choice ticker type questions, we use colored cards in physics, so A is red and B is blue and what have you, um, or walking around and in the, the lecture theater while students were doing an exercise looking at their work. Okay. Um, I wanted feedback in terms of their content knowledge, what they knew before they walked in, uh, what they were doing, the exercises I gave them, conceptual understanding coming out of that. Also wanted feedback in terms of metacognition. Give me a mark out of five for how you, uh, for whether you've learned something useful today at the end of a lecture. And then also positioned as wanting to know about their feelings at the beginning of a lecture. My favourite one is give me a mark out of five for how you're feeling today. Okay, where one is terrible and five is great. Um, you could also position those as being about being interested in students as human beings. Um, also, I was surprised, even though I know I make an effort to learn names, I was surprised to see myself using students' names 
some students' names in the second lecture. I was like, how did I get that right? Um, and then also gave them a question in which I found out very various details where they came from and what have you, what language they spoke. Um, I also positioned myself as the one who frames the content, the pedagogy, the pacing, and also makes the decisions about assessment. Okay, so that was my what I could see in the way I framed, uh, I positioned myself. All right. Um, and the one who has a right to regulate students, even outside of lectures, get into a study group, um, spend the time before lectures usefully. All right. Um, so back to this idea of power being a network of boundaries. The question is, have I done anything to entrench or to shift power boundaries in the way I position students and myself? Um, so I think there is a significant shift in positioning the student as capable and the lecturer as fallible and doing that, do, doing both of those every single lecture. I think that has potential to shift a boundary, to shift, yeah, shift a power boundary. Um, but I have entrenched the boundary that places all the decisions which really matter within the lecturer's domain. which limits the student to operating within the boundaries that I set if they want credit for the course. I, I have the ultimate power. Um, in regard to UCT, I positioned it, and I didn't have much to say about it, but when I did refer to it, um, I can only identify the way that I positioned it as monolithic and unchanging. Um, so you need to get used to working in this way. It's the only way to survive. Um, and there's a difference there between the student needing to change and the university is unchanging. Um, and then physics, um, I'm positioned as a discipline that's a simplification of reality. Reality is very simple, physics works with models, and that is how physicists understand it. Um, and if you want to work with those models, they're always simplifications of reality. You set friction to zero, you treat a body as, as, a, as, as a rigid body, even though it's not really Etc. Um, and so, I mean, uh, theoretical physicists want to know before before they listen to any other theoretical physicist's work. What are your assumptions? What are you setting to zero in the work that you're doing in the model that you're presenting? Nonetheless, it, it has its uses. I also set it up as one knowledge space amongst others. Okay. Um, and so we had a conversation where I asked the students to identify for me the differences in the way that knowledge works in those th three different spaces. Um, uh, how is truth decided on? Who are the authorities? How is knowledge communicated? Um, and I've said that in any knowledge space, some people have more authority than others, and that they're three different games, three different ways of doing things, played by different rules, um, particular system of what counts as knowledge. Yeah. Um, and also described them, having sp spoken about language previously, as three different languages for thinking with, okay. thinking about reality. I also gave them Barber's typology of the relationship between science and religion. There are four different ways of viewing the relationship. You can view them as being in conflict. You can view them as being part of one greater integrated whole, etc. cetera. They're, they're different ways in dialogue, etc. Presented it to students and said, I want you to decide where you fit in and recognized that within the class, holding up their clicker cards, their different colored cards, that there was a, a diversity of different responses. Okay, so back to that question. Um, the students in our courses tend to think that physics is a collection of facts about the world and equations for doing calculations, and all of the above have been proved correct by experiment. Um, okay. So to move it to simply one of many games for making sense of reality is a potentially a um, boundary shifting move. Um, students also have expectations about a physics lecturer's job, as I alluded to earlier. Um, and so they place boundaries on my behavior, um, and especially coming in as the female lecturer, um, where some of them have come from backgrounds where they've learned that physics is not for women, I particularly have boundaries on my behavior and what's acceptable. So I have to buy space for unorthodox practices, um, like bringing in other languages and other knowledge spaces. Um, and so what I do is in the first lecture, I ask students why they didn't do so well in the first physics test. I put up a list of options. They get out their colored cards and respond. 
and, the, uh, and their responses show that it's not just about the physics content, it's all about all the other stuff of being at, at university. And I think probably people in this room know enough of, 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 of all of that. And that therefore, it's not going to solve the, the problem of their marks, their poor marks in physics to just do the content again. Actually, we need to address all these other issues. I don't use the word specifically, but it's a, the other issues of power and identity, really. Um, and so the students bought into this, and they colluded with me in disrupting this, this boundary of what is acceptable in physics. So, in conclusion, um, having done this analysis, I think that my positioning does have potential to disrupt the power differential between physics and EDP students. Um, and that's supported by also disrupting the power differential between the physics lecturer and the physics student. Okay? But it's undermined um, by entrenching my power to make the decisions which really count, um, and, and the power of the university to remain unchanging. Right. And that is all I have to say. <laughs> so I hope, yeah. because this chapter is in process. It's under revision at the moment. Um, and I really like, the reason that I'm presenting here is because I like some critique of, of, of what I've done here. So don't be afraid to, to do so. Yes? Have you got some kind of external reviewer to you? Also, those videos that's No, I haven't. This was purely a self-reflection thing. And the intention of the... Um, of this book that I'm contributing a chapter towards is to open up the, to, to focus on the, the extended curriculum lecturer um, and open up their, their practice, yeah, their thinking. Gail, yeah, um, what about the more sort of sociological, I mean, obviously if you're a woman and you're white in South Africa and the students are, I think, most you black people of color, yeah. So, so it has, does that come into the power relations? Yes, it does. And that comes into the stuff that I haven't, that's not explicit. Right. Um, right. What I was analyzing here was simply my moves within the lecture and how those, right. yeah. so, so the limitations, yeah. Right. yeah. So what's yeah. not observable yeah. is... Absolutely. Um, yeah. Obviously, that's part of it, right. yeah. Right. Um, but that's ameliorated by the fact that, yeah, I may be white, but I'm a woman. Can you trust a woman to teach you right. physics? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had comments in... Um, course evaluations previously that lady lecturers should not teach physics because they're too emotional. Um, and it's not that I'm, I thought, where was I emotional? And I've burst into tears. And it's not that. It's just a stereotype. I've heard things like, Dale may be a woman, but she did quite a good job. <laughs> so, I mean, it's real. It's real. Yeah. So do you have any white students in the class? Okay, so because students can choose, because it's no longer based on disadvantage whether you come into these courses, white students may choose to. This year, unusually, I don't. Usually, I have two or three. Um, and their students, uh, yeah, um, uh, there, there are various reasons why students come into the course. One of the students I had last year um, has, a, has a learning disability. Um, and so he, he, one of the white students. Um, I've had a, a, a rugby player before who just wanted to, to ease off his load so he could do, do better with rugby. Um, I had a student who was traveling a long way from up north somewhere. Her travel time just meant that she couldn't do a full load. So yeah, there are various reasons why students come into the class. But it's quite nice that it's no longer uh, that the university chooses. Um, even though the university has still got the whole disadvantage factor story, um, students feel they have some agency. They don't always make good choices. They, they will get a second chance to choose to come into my course late now, at the beginning of this term of the we had to become. Yeah. Um, I just want to follow the, um, the question at the back yes. uh, about um, whether it's been peer reviewed, especially from the student's perspective. And I, I'm going to worry about a quick response that you are being reflexive because you have looked at your own analysis. Yes, yes. That for me, reflexivity requires an intersectional gaze, right? Yes. So it's the students analyzing it. It might be a faculty member also analyzing yes. it. Um, yeah, a reflexivity might... I, I worry about that flat analysis. It seems like a me-search. 
perspective. Yes. yes. So maybe yes. if a student analyzes it as well, it could intersection, it could provide you with intersectionalis, intersectionality, sorry, yes. Um, taken up by that, it's it's yeah. something that the yeah. students do need to provide. Um, and then the the way that the um, that it was opened up about you know phys physicists having an empirical um, outlook on data, I wonder if that's not perhaps how we are meant to. Because I didn't see in your analysis maybe a numerical count of um, I've, if I've been um, if I've said a student's name, I've done it so many times. There was just a trust that you know we had to accept your data yes. because you were physicists. Yes. So I think those those analyses could help your um, the program perhaps give more credibility to that. Even intersectionality as a as a concept that is in the humanities can be trafficked into these hard sciences and could free up some of the bias that historically physicists are only really linear. Yes. So I think I like the appreciation of, of the concept. I, I think it could help in um, the humanities for us if you are endeavouring on this yes. part. Yes. Yeah. I have given some numerical values to some of the things where I've said things have happened every lecture or only once, um, but there are some that I haven't. Um, and obviously in the analysis that was there, but I haven't I haven't presented that. Mm. Yeah. So in the analysis there was some counting. Mm. Yeah. 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 Good help. And. Yeah, I mean, what I was so it's been a challenge to, to do this because it was an attempt to step outside of myself mm. and look back, but that's what the, the the collection of chapters is wanting. It's not wanting data about students or the success of courses or even student views on things. It's wanting the lecturer's view. And it was very interesting for me. I thought it would be boring watching my lectures again. I didn't expect to be surprised by what I saw in them six weeks later. So it was very it was a very interesting exercise to come out of it did give me some measure of stepping back from myself. Um, I was the person who gave the lectures, I thought I knew what, all of what was there kind of thing. Um, and yet even just six weeks later I did manage to to, to it gave, did give me something of a fresh perspective, but it is very limited, I agree. Um, so question comment about the the power of the university to to being unchanging. Yes. And that the university does change, but on a timeline that is much longer than an average undergraduate's time yes. here. And so when, when we're talking about power games and power manipulation of these sorts, that how students who are aware of these things, of these structures of power, might choose to decide that, well, given the timeline that I'm here for, what is my capacity to effect a change on this high inertia object? And therefore, is it not my strategic best interest to leave it as it is and work with that as a constant versus a student who might look at that and go, actually, I can't live with how that is. Yeah, and therefore, yeah. I feel the need to make a change. But understand that when you try to make a change to such a large system, what the knock-on effects might be and how shocked those might be. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think that my stance can certainly be uh, criticised insofar as we've seen with the student protest that the students really do have power um, to maybe not shift things a huge amount, but certainly to shift. Uh, I think there's been a huge shift in understanding um, compared to when I arrived here in 2011. Um, so, yeah, I'm not saying the university is monolithic and unchanging, but that's how I... I, what I can see and what I did in the first seven lectures. And remember, there's a whole lot more force that comes. Um, that's what I said. Yeah. And I wasn't trying to position the university when I said that. I was just trying to help students negotiate their way as the students who've, who've had this dreadful first term at the university. Yeah. Have you considered doing the exact same thing halfway through the second semester? It'd be an interesting thing to do. I haven't. Because, <laughs> because for the first seven lectures, you're almost recapping what they did in the mainstream course. So you no, it's actually quite that. different. Is it? Is yeah, it? yeah. So we, we forget what they did. They had such a bad experience with that stuff. We do it again at the end of the year. Okay. Um, and what I, we, this course has always started, even when it wasn't this particular model of only starting in the second quarter, it started with a tools and skills model okay. that um, kind of focuses on the 
mathematical and conceptual tools they need rather than the actual physics, but in the context of the physics. Um, and so the module that I teach here is a module that I developed that I added to that on, it's called scientific reasoning. So relationships, yeah. So you're not rehashing the Not rehashing what came earlier, yeah. Okay. yeah. But that's a deliberate move. Thank you very much. I think I'm the only thing standing between you and tea. <laughs> Maybe you want to